Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, so tonight's talk, I'm going to give you a quick run through a talk I give to public groups quite commonly. And so it's not particularly scholarly, I have to apologize. Uh, in fact, it's probably more a picture show of the, the fossil tre treasures of Northern New Zealand. Many of you probably know uh, of the wonderful fossils that come from the South Island, Canterbury and Otago, but seldom do we hear about the, the great fossil heritage we have here in Northern New Zealand. I just pull on this. Oh, I was cut down the, the public part a little bit, but to, just to start for some of you, what are fossils? I use the definition that they're the remains or trace of a plant or an animal preserved in rock. There's a trace down here. I'll go through these quite quickly. So is this a fossil, for example? I'm happy to call these 1,000 year old bones buried by sand dunes a fossil. Others would call it uh, a subfossil because they're not buried in rock. Uh, but I'm not too worried about that definition. I'm calling everything that's uh, this old a fossil. Kinds of fossil preservation we can see. Many uh, members of the public that I hear from think that fossils are only those that are being turned to stone. But in fact, many of the fossils we see, as you all know, are unchanged shells and skeletons such as these. Uh, let's get this out of the way. There are uh, another kind of fossil preservation is in fact petrifaction or turning it to stone, the replacement of the cells uh, by silica in this case to get petrified wood. Why is that not moving on for me? It's stuck for me there, Daniel. Click your mouse again or else the forward button. I'm doing both of that. Oh, there it's come along at last. Um, also, there's carbonization of woody or chitinous material. Uh, the decomposition by anaerobic bacteria removes the oxygen and nitrogen, and often the fossils are rich in black carbon and are flattened, as we see in this. We're going to have this problem all the way along. Hope not. There we go. Uh, we also get molds and casts where the rocks hardened around the, the particular fossil and then the fossil's been dissolved or decomposed. So in this instance, we see molds and down in here we see, for example, the cast inside of a, a gastropod shell. We also get other fossils that are the impressions and traces of organisms left behind, but not the organism themselves. And so we call these trace fossils. So we have and divide the fossils uh, into macrofossils, those which you can see easily with the naked eye, microfossils that really require a microscope like this to see them, and of course, trace fossils. And this talk tonight is largely based on the, the macrofossils and a few trace fossils of Northern New Zealand. Now here's a geological map of Northern New Zealand. This is the area I'll be talking about the, that the fossils have come from. So you will see down the bottom here, I don't go south of the Waikato River. So we're not going to see the, the lovely rich faunas that come from the Port Waikato and Kafi areas of Triassic and Jurassic. But we are going to see fossils from many of the different rock types that we get in Northern New Zealand. And you can see from the map, there are a wide variety of rocks outcropping in Northern New Zealand. We have the basement gray wackies of Permian to early Cretaceous age in dark blue and dark purple, running along the east side of Northland here and also over in the Coromandel. We have the Tikawiti group, late Eocene, Oligocene in light blue, sitting directly on top of that in situ. And on top of that, we often get the sandstones and mudstones of early Miocene age in orange through here. You can see covering a large area, the Waitamata group, the Otawa group up here around Hokianga and the Paringaringa group in the far north. Also in situ, we have many volcanic rocks of younger age. We have andesite volcanoes in pink, forming this line down here on the west coast and also some down the east coast and of course through the Coromandel Peninsula. We have rhyolite and dacite volcanoes, primarily the light pinks over here in the Coromandel Ranges. And the young basalt volcanoes appear in bright red in North Auckland, around Whangarei, Auckland and South Auckland as you see here. And then we have the, the quaternary, the sand dune barriers in bright yellow running along the west coast up here into the far north forming the Tombola linking North Cape to the rest of the country and the lighter yellow, the young alluvial rocks. 
These are the in situ rocks that we're getting fossils from, but we also have displaced rocks, rocks that came in from the northeast here around about 20 million years ago and were displaced on top of Northland in here. So we, these are deep water displaced rocks of the Northland Alochthon in the dark and light greens through here, which are the sedimentary rocks, and the purples through here, which are the deep water volcanic rocks of Cretaceous phase. That's a, a quick summary of the geology of Northland. And we can also represent it uh, through geological columns such as this. So we have the time here, the epochs down here on the right with the millions of years coming up through here on the scale. So down the bottom here, of course, we have the in situ gray wackies of Permian to early Cretaceous age. Uh, and then you'll see there's a large time gap, uplift and erosion during this period from uh, mid Cretaceous through to late Eocene in here. And that period of time is represented by the de displaced deep water rocks of the Northland Alokthon. We have the, the deep water volcanics over here in purple, and we have Cretaceous, Paleocene, Eocene, and Oligocene deep water rocks that have been displaced onto Northland. But sitting in situ on the Grey Wackies, we have the Tikawiti group of late Eocene through to Oligocene limestones here, then the early Miocene, mainly White and Matar group sandstones, and this is the incoming of those displaced rocks in here at the time. And then the latter part of the Cenozoic are primarily terrestrial volcanics, as you can see through here from the early Miocene right through to the present day, with some younger quaternary sediments that we're talking about. So I'll be showing you some of these maps and some of these columns as we go through, just to show you the setting in which we find the fossils. So I'll start from the oldest fossils through to the youngest of northern New Zealand and show you some of the treasures we found up there that are in our various collections around the country. Uh, first of all, the fossils, the oldest ones of Permian through to Jurassic age, 260 to 150 million years. As I said previously, these rocks outcrop along the eastern side of Northland and Auckland through here, and a few up here in, in Coromandel on Great Barrier. And here they are against the time scale here. The Waipapa terrain outcrops on land together with the Capels terrain in here and in here, but the Dun Mountain Ophiolite Belt and the Murihuku terrain are buried beneath Northland and Auckland only outcrop further south of this particular area. These particular rocks are not rich in fossils, but uh, we do have the oldest fossils in the North Island, up here in the north at Marble Bay near Whangaroa. They occur amongst pillow lavas in lenses of limestone that have been metamorphosed to marble, as we can see here. They're derived from shells of 265 million year old late Permian shallow water mollusks, corals and foraminifera as you can see on the column over here. Here's some pictures of them. These are corals, reef corals, that were described early on by Lead in 1956. And we also have fusulinid foraminifera, extinct for large foraminifera. This one here is about one and a half centimeters across. And they're of this age, as you can see. Now the reef corals and the fusulinid foraminifera colonize the upper parts of seamounts. In other words, they uh, require photic conditions, so they're very shallow water, and these seamounts had erupted in the tropical parts of the ancient Pacific Ocean near the equator, and these fossils have Tethian uh, linkages. Plate tectonics rafted them from this area up here near the equator, 2,000 kilometers southeastwards over 40 million years, until they reached the coast of Gondwana down here in the and the grey wacky rocks containing these fossils were then plastered into the accretionary prism on the side of the supercontinent of Gondwana. And that's how some of these rocks got from the equator all the way down, uh, be mixed in with the more Southern colleagues. We also have uh, the only known single-armed cladded crinoid fossil in New Zealand. Here's a reconstruction by Mike Eagle here. This is also uh, the equal oldest fossil in the North Island. It in fact comes from Pukati Forest in the Capels terrain over here in the central part of northern New Zealand. Uh, here are some of its stem and uh, arm ossicles, and here's some of the calyx cup plates. You'll see it's quite a small fossil, this one here. It's only about, the pebble is only three or four centimetres across, and it was found by a, a geoclubber, Liz Hoskins, in 2017. In the grey wacky of the Waipapa terrain, the terrain is <laughs> moderately uh, metamorphosed and intensely deformed, and so fossils are rare, very rare in the Waipapa terrain itself. There are a few bits of vellumite out here in the Coromandel Great Barrier and on, in, uh, on Waiheke and Ponui, 
And here are two of the only fossil bivalves that have been come out of the Waipapa. They came from down here, Tafranui Peninsula, and are of late Jurassic age, Retroceramus hasti, uh, published on by Bernard Spurley and others. So that's a quick rundown of our rather sparse older Mesozoic and Permian treasures from Northern New Zealand. Let's move up into the fossils of Cretaceous age. As I said before, uh, all the Cretaceous uh, rocks over here are part of the displaced Northland lock form. And so here are some of the lithologies and units they're coming out of. And the first ones are these two bones here. They're probably Mosasaur bones of Cretaceous age. Uh, their actual locality in Northland that they came from is unknown. Uh, they are in the Auckland University collection, but they must be from the north and the Lockthorn rocks of this age. Here's another lovely bone. Some, I'm sure all of you recognize it, correct? Yes. You all recognized it as a jawbone fragment, this little black bit here of an ichthyosaur. And this comes from uh, late Cretaceous uh, near Dargaville, coming out of these displaced rocks. And this is Margaret Morley's depiction of an ichthyosaur of that age, about 70 million years old. And we, of course, have this in situ uh, giant mussel. Uh, this is 1.2 meters long, was found at Whakapirao uh, on the Kaipara Harbor, and it's been identified as Megadiceramus rangitata and 95 million years old. I believe uh, I've seen one like this that James Crampton there got out of the Uruweras uh, of similar age and it sits at GNS at the present time. Uh, this is one of the largest fossil bivalve mollusks ever found, and it's larger than all the living tropical giant clams that we know. This was so big it couldn't be taken out, but Gray and Gibson from the university organized to have a mold and plaster made of it. And a number of casts were then taken out of the mold and have been on display. Pardon? And have been on display at the Auckland Museum and Auckland University at times. Yeah. What happened there? Now, there we go. We also have ammonites, of course. We don't have the giant ammonite that's a bit further south from here. But these, of course, are shelled, extinct shelled squid. We have some very nice specimens collected by a number of different people, including Mackay and Alan Mason. This is Kitchenites from Tiopu on the Kaipa Harbour, just down in here, of late Cretaceous age. Uh, many of the ammonites in Northland come out of the insides of, of concretions out of these Cretaceous uh, deep sea sediments in the Northland Alokthon. We also have straight ammonites such as Baculites rectus coming from the Matakoi arm. These uh, concretions here are from a well-known fossil locality, Bull Point, also on the Kaipara Harbour. So that's the Cretaceous, the Meso all the Mesozoic fossils that I'm going to show you tonight. Let's move on to some of the fossils that come from the in situ rocks in North that haven't been displaced, the shallow water Tikawiti group of late Eocene through to Oligocene age here. The late Eocene first off is mostly Ruatangata sandstone and green sand, Carmo coal measures, and uh, then we get into the Whangarei limestone of Oligocene age over there. If you look at the map, there's the basement in dark blue, and the very light blue is this very thin skin of Tikawiti group rocks sitting directly on the unconformity eroded into the, the basement wipe up terrain. For the late uh, Eocene, 35 million years ago, here's a depiction of how we think the geo geography at the time looked. The green, as you can see over here, is the land covering most of the eastern parts of, of the southern Northland. The light blue is the shallower seas and the darker blue, the deep seas. And so we had deep marine fossils buried here that have been brought in by the Alokthon, shallow marine fossils uh, are in situ and would be deposited in the lighter blue areas. And we get uh, terrestrial fossils in the coal measures in some of the valleys <coughs> around the coast, the Carmo coal measures in the south of Waikato. So the best uh, North Island Eocene leaf flora comes from down here at Drury in the Drury coal measures or part of the Waikato coal measures. Uh, there are lake deposits that they're coming out of that overlie coal. This is a thin coal. Uh, layer in here in a road cutting just inland from Papakura. The pole itself has the odd uh, gum, kauri gum piece within it. Here's some lovely leaves coming out from that locality, beautiful late Eocene fern. 
You can see that the descriptions of them were in the early days, 1864, 1930. Ungard was describing specimens collected by Hochstetter in the area of the northern Hunuas. Also in those same beds, lake beds, we see late Eocene freshwater mussels. Uh, this particular one here doesn't have a name yet, and it's quite different from the modern freshwater mussels, as you can see, and quite large indeed. Some of them are coming from cuttings just above a, a grey wacky quarry, one of the largest grey wacky quarries we've got in, in New Zealand now, in the northern Hunuas. That's down in this area through here. Moving on, we come to the, we've done the coal measures, we come up into the Ruatangata sandstones, shallow water, like the Dwarfnetic sandstones. One of the big, big exposures is in this road cutting beside the Kaio road bridge. So you can see it closer up. And in the Ruatangata sandstones, we get a number of fossils, some of them quite uh, unique. There's this beautiful Eocene starfish here, a sea star, named by Mike Eagle as Zoraster ongaraensis. Uh, from Reserve Point, coming from this locality here on the northern Whangarei Harbour. It's a, one of only two described fossil starfish on the Cenozoic in New Zealand, my understanding. This particular starfish lived on sand at mid-shelf depths, about 50 to 100 metres deep. The carnivore and scavenger were eating mollusks, worms and crustacea. Just to have it, my computer's having another breather. Do, do, do. Don't know why it does this. Doesn't want to go backwards, doesn't want to go forwards. Walk amongst yourselves. <laughs> well, I've been doing this all day and it doesn't do this when I'm on my own, my computer without projecting like this. Why don't I try that? No, that's not doing anything either. Um, perhaps while it's thinking or processing the there next we go. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we also have rhodoliths, late Eocene rhodoliths in the Ruatangata sandstone. These beautiful calcareous red algae that form these beautiful balls here. The photo here is 40 centimeters across. They grow with the centers of pebbles usually and gradually grow bigger and bigger. They live in shallow water, of course, because they are, they've got to be in the photic zone because they photosynthesize and they're usually under strong current conditions in clean water. Here you can see a whole bed just full of rhodoliths, beautiful, down here on the southern shores of Whangarei Harbour. There's also some in this limestone just beneath the real Tangata sandstone in the quarry near Whangarei. Now, what are these fossils? I'm sure Daniel knows what these fossils are. He can recognize them immediately. Uh, but can you? I can't. So they're the bones of late Eocene fossil sea turtles. And uh, Jack Grant Mackey uh, described with Jane Hill and Brian Gill, two species from the late Eocene Ruatangata sandstone, one from uh, Whangare, north of Whangarei Harbour and another from Pahi back in uh, 2011. There's at least four species of sea turtle known from the New Zealand mid to late Eocene, and we've got two of them here in Northland. We also have some la lovely crabs inside concretions, matching some of those that come out from Taranaki in uh, North Canterbury, for example. These are late Eocene crabs, also from the southern shores of Whangarei Harbour, from this area through here. Tumida carcinus giganteus. This one's identified as you can see, it's about 12 centimeters across. So those are some of the uh, Eocene fossils, deep water fossils of Oligocene age coming from the displaced rocks in the dark green through here. We have one or two, but not many because they're very deep water. The rock we get of the, in the Oligocene from deep water is uh, Maharingi limestone, as you can see here, often highly sheared because it's been transported a long way. The Portland quarry at Whangarei is made entirely of this of muddy limestone. And these days, it's the source of all of New Zealand's made cement. But the fossil I'm showing you is the one you'll all recognize, a trace fossil, Zuphicus. Here's my camera lens ca case. As you, so you can see the distance across here is about 40 centimeters. This is a deep water enigmatic trace fossil called Zuphicus. And it's from Red Vale Quarry down here, just north of Auckland in the Maharangi limestone. It's one of the most poorly understood worldwide. It occurs in rocks, deep water rocks of Cambrian right through to Quaternary age. And yet 
we don't really know what formed it, to my understanding, even now. Here's a, another lovely fossil, a treasure of Northland, this beautiful fish fossil of late Oligocene age, which came out from in situ Tikawiti Group limestone just south of Bongaray there. Uh, it's a lanternfish, the only fossil lanternfish I know of. There are lanternfish otoliths around, but not fish like this in New Zealand. It lived in the dark depths of the ocean greater than 200 meters water depth. Moving on to the early Miocene, which are all these orange areas through Northland, large areas of early Miocene age sedimentary rocks. And you can see it up here, ranging in age from about 22 through to 17 million years or 16 million years. Uh, in the early Miocene, this is a reconstruction of the geography of Northern New Zealand, the green being land, the blue being sea, getting shallow around the edges and deeper offshore, and two lines of active volcanoes here, one down the west coast, another one on the east coast, uh, terrestrial, these ones being marine. And so we have fossils coming from the shallow water in around the edges here of the Waitamata Basin, uh, also up in these basins, the Parengaringa and Hokianga basins up here, we also have some shallow water fossils that uh, were preserved in the white matter basin just as it was beginning to subside. So there's shallow water base or white matter fossils. So here's a fossil from those rocks. Does anybody know this one? Can't wait to see where I can't see all of you, so I don't know if anybody has got their hand up or not. It certainly had me flummoxed for a while. Uh, and we've identified that as the tooth plate of a ras. Uh, here's a modern banded ras here. It's the pharyngeal tooth plate of modern wrasses or labyrinths. Uh, common, these fish are common around warm water reefs and sca scavengers. These pharyngeal teeth in the back of the throat grind mollusk shells that they eat. These are the pharyngeal tooth plates of modern wrasse, and this is our fossil one from Fossil Bay on Waiheke Island uh, in the base of Waita Matters in here. Many of you will have seen these particular trace fossils. You can see my hammer for the size there. This one is from Matheson's Bay. This one's from the Manukau Harbour, Kakamatua. And uh, these were published on by Murray Gregory some time ago and identifies as the fossil eagle ray burrows. As the eagle, eagle ray comes in and feeds, sends down jets of water into the sediment and it excavates this particular hole here, looking for live bivalve. It sucks up and crunches on and enjoys. This is the uh, trace of a modern eagle ray. Here's where it's been feeding. Barb was out the back here. You can actually see the front of it here, the wings out either side on modern shore. Uh, this, of course, you recognize as a cat's eye. It's a giant subtropical cat's eye, Sama turbo superbus, 15 centimeters diameter across. And it has very large opercula like this. Often we just get the, the opercula. They're very common in these basal white matters of early Miocene age. Uh, these one from Kawao Island, but they're also known from places like Matheson's Island and what Matheson's Bay and Waiheke Island. Here's just to give you some idea of some of the other fossil mollusks of this age. Here's some some tropical cone shells. Uh, this one from Pac one's from Pakarangi Point from the Kuiper Harbour, very rich early Miocene locality. Cone shells are carnivorous and predatory and all cone snails are venomous and capable of stinging humans. Live ones should never be handled as their venomous sting will occur without warning and can on occasions be fatal. So just watch out for these fossil cone shells, typical of warm water environments. We have fossil power, four species known from the early Miocene of Northern New Zealand. Uh, some of them described by Powell, others by Mike Eagle. Over. They're herbivorous on intertidal and shallow subtidal hard substrates, and rocky shore fossils are rare in New Zealand, as Daphne will tell you from her rich site down in Southland. But we have rich sites in the base of White Matters as well, up here in, north, in the north. You can see this one's from Mitty Matty, Kauau, Kauau, and Matheson's Bay, these particular described species. Some more to illustrate the diversity and beautiful preservation of some of the early Miocene mollusks. This is from Peringaringa, Tipokri Cliffs, Echinophoria hectori, an area that Larry Wakefield, who's watching tonight, did his PhD on. These live in the seafloor sea sand at depth of about 0 to 100 meters water depth, and they prey on heart urchins. It's a live one today. We have, of course, large oysters, such as the Panostria, 
live attached to hard substrates at also at shallow water depths. This one here is from Fossil Bay on Waiheke, and this is from Tihoka Beach up there in the North Cape area. But you know what these fossils are? There's two different kinds of fossil in here that I'm going to point out and talk about. These ones here and uh, up here, up here, and then there's these tubular ones as well. Note my lovely scale here from back in the day. The day. So the first are these here, the giant barnacle plates, Bathylasma or Clandica, described named from this particular locality at the foot of a uh, submarine sea stack of grey wacky. These barnacles were obviously living attached to the, to the sea stack when it was depths of greater than 500 metres water depth. When they died, they fell off into the sea floor and got buried by the sand, and that's where they're found, right around the base of the sea stack there. They're 20 million years old in the base of White Amatis. Here's a, a locality at Matheson's Bay with as vast numbers of these plates all stacked up together. And this is a modern example of Bathylasma uh, shell accumulation. This we dredged at a thousand meters depth uh, on the Macquarie Ridge a few years ago. Here's the best example I know of Bathylasma oclandica. This one's in the GNS collections and the specimen hasn't fallen apart. So it's still in its growth position with all the individual plates in, in position. And that brings us to the second fossil in this particular block, these tubular, solid tubular pieces. These are the nodes of deep sea octocoral keratoisis, which lives attached to hard substrates and usually found at bathyal and greater depths. Here's a, a couple of modern examples, as you can see here. And when these die, they fall apart at the internodes, which are chitinous, keeping them together. And we just get the nodes preserved like this in the basal white matters. So this is a picture of the Waitamata Basin around 20 million years ago. We had land in the north, the Northland land area. We had the shelf area around the Kaipara, where we've been getting some of the fossils I've been showing you. And right on the basal part of the Waitamata, we get the basal Waitamata, shallow water sediments that I've been showing you fossils from. But as the Waitamata Basin subsided, it developed into a deep basin, 1,000 to 3,000 meters water depth. And sediment coming down the rivers accumulated in the north and periodically slurries of the sediment flowed down submarine canyons into the basin floor as turbidity currents as you can see here and were deposited as layers of sand over the floor of the of the basin are becoming the white matar sandstones as we can see here you can see numerous turbidites interbedded with mudstones typical uh, exposures we see all around of Auckland these particular beds have very few fossils but there are, have been one or two that have been found in there uh, that I'll show you of some, some of. First of all, there's some fossils on the sides of submarine canyons. So the submarine canyon exposed at just south of Murawai, a place called Powell Bay and Bartram Bay. This is the edge of the submarine canyon that's been eroded into these sediments here. And these are the burrows of a crustacean that's going in about 50 centimeters into that submarine canyon wall. And for 20 centimeters, beneath that unconformity, beneath the submarine canyon sediments, there's a bioturbated burrowed uh, assemblage there. Specialist ichthyologists that came to New Zealand to look at this claim it's the best exposure of deep bathy or canyon wall trace fossils anywhere in the world. It's south of Murawai, but it's not very easy to get. In the deep water sediments, sometimes in the, the finer sandstones between the turbidites, we get deep water solitary corals, such as this uh, Trochocyathus papakura ensis, named from papakura down in the northern Hunua. Um, also there, this quite often we get pelagic pteropods of snails like this one, Medganella. And the uh, tall sea lilies or complete sea lilies, sea lilies are quite rare in New Zealand, but two complete sea lilies have been found, interestingly enough, within the Waitamata Basin sediments and the deep water sediments at uh, Long Bay and on Motutapu Island. These are the two here that are in the Auckland University collection. Here's a modern feather star and a modern sea lily for comparison with these two fossils. But the Waitamata sandstones are famous for their trace fossils. They got a, a wide diversity of trace fossils. Here's just three of the more common sorts. This one here are phycodes, these burrowing traces through here and the, the fine sandstones above the the top of the turbidites. 
This is uh, Scalicia that I'll show you again in a minute. This is a, an open burrow system made by a crustacean, Ophiomorpha nodosa, and lined with uh, mud balls. And here's a very intriguing, intricate Helminthoides trace fossil. But the most common and easy to recognize is Scolicia, made by a sand burrowing echinoid or heart urchin. Here's a modern heart urchin on a beak. And you can see as it's moving along, backpacking the sand and you know, the meniscus layers you can see there indicate the way it was moving. So here we have one Scalicia and it was moving in this direction. It was of course a heart urchin burrowing its way through the upper sediment layers of the deep sea floor. And here we can see another one and it's left behind a trail uh, out from the anus, fecal trail as it's going along as well. Found in this volcanic clastic mud flow deposit within the Waitamata group, uh, is this tooth here. It's the fossil cow shark tooth found by another geo clubber on our field club trip. Murray, in fact, is watching tonight, I think. You found that in 1996 uh, at uh, Aitarakihi. Yes, Hugh Grenfell here. And that's what a cow shark looks like today. Commonly in the Waitamata deep water sediments, we find pieces of wood that have been bored out or eaten out by shipworm, Torito. And so here we see an example. They became waterlogged and fell to the uh, floor of the deep ocean where they've been preserved. But they were being uh, eaten out by the shipworm while they were floating around in the oceans, like the modern shipworm you can see here, a bivalve, of course. Also in the deep water sediments, we occasionally get examples of deep water wood-eating limpets. Here's one here described by Bruce Marshall and John Buckridge from Long Bay down here near Auckland, uh, Pectinodonta waitamata. There is also occurrences at Murawai of this wood-eating um, limpet. They all occur in association again with waterlogged carbonized <laughs> It's fallen to the sea of the floor of the sea and been eaten by this Pectinodonta, which lived today at 400 to 4,500 meters water depth. So quite a rare fossil uh, type anywhere in the world. And ju just this year, Geo Club found another uh, piece of wood in here and associated with it was this wood-eating limpet, but also these small trochospiral uh, gastropods, which are only five millimeters across. These are scanomorph snails. They're not well enough preserved to identify or be too sure of the, uh, the genus identification, but it seems it's the first known fossilized location of these types of snails, the scanomorph, anywhere in the world. This is found uh, just south of Tor Bay in the Waitamata sediments during a geo -club. Also in the deep water of the early Miocene over at Murawai is another fossil starfish, Sudacaster mototaraensis, again described by Mike Eagle, uh, living at mid-bathial depths, 1,000 to 2,000 meters water depth. And you can see examples of modern species of this extinct starfish, the only one of its kind in existence. Now here's an interesting fossil. What is this fossil? Well here, strange enough, is Prof Bartram in about 1930. You can see in 1948, Bartram published in the Journal of Paleontology, a little paper headed two undetermined New Zealand tertiary fossils. He was asking the paleontologists of the world, could they give him some suggestions as to what this particular fossil might be? He'd found it in what we now know to be deep water sediments south of Murawai, just in this locality here, down at Murawai. It just so happens that this is the area I did my PhD in, and while I was doing it, the specimen of, of Bartram's came to light in the collections. And I found many more of them in these beds down here, is some looking just like this. Showing them to a polychaete expert, Michael Miller, we concluded it was New Zealand's only soft-bodied worm fossils which I named Archisabella bartrami, fan worm, which would have looked something like this, having a parchment tube and a segmented body and a fan coming out the top there. And the interpretation is that they lived at shallow water out on the shelf and they were transported down the submarine canyon. This is a submarine canyon fill sedimentary sequence here. And the segmented worms, as they were being transported, withdrew down inside their parchment tubes, as you can see here. They were then buried in the soft shape segmented shape of the body was preserved by mud inside the tube and later it's been calcified 
to show up as the segmented part of the, of the fossil. And we can actually see the parchment tube still on the outside here. Now at Murawai, we also have a submarine uh, volcanic clastic deposit. It's brought down a lot of shallow marine fossils with it from the sides of the volcano. And amongst those are the heads of hermotypic or reef corals. In fact, reef coral heads are known in the early Miocene throughout much of Northern New Zealand at all these different localities we've got down through here in red. And they're all only single heads so that they show that was never of the development of a large coral reef like the Great Barrier Reef, but they're more just single heads growing in shallow water around volcanoes and shallow places, a bit like we get around the Kermadec Islands today. There are 12 species have been recorded and they indicate that the seawater was five to seven degrees warmer at that time than it is now around Northern New Zealand. And recently, I photographed this wonderful network, burrow network. This is three meters across here. Also at Murawai, it's in deep water sediments, maybe a thousand to 2000 meters water depth. And it contains a number of chili of the ghost shrimp. And these are fo fossil ghost shrimp claws inside the burrow network that they had made. It's the only known example in New Zealand of fossil burrows with the fossil remains of the organism that made them preserved inside. Up into shallower water on the uh, upper slopes of the Waitamata Basin, we had an active volcano off there, the Kaipara volcano, and it erupted ignimbrites at various times, which flattened a forest, and we get the molds of some of those logs that were flattened and carried along. And a little bit lower down, we find the silicified remains of some of the, the logs have been preserved within the ignimbrite of early Miocene age up there in the Kaipara. In the Kaipara also, in moderately shallow water, this fossil was found uh, in the 1970s down here. It appears to be the broken part of the internal skeleton of a small squid, Spirula spirula, or the ram's horn shell. It's the world's oldest known fossil ram's horn shell. This is the organism. Here's the shell up in here today. And you can see it swims along, usually with its head down, and its tail up. And this used for buoyancy, changing the, the uh, gas content inside the shell allows it to go up and down in the seawater. And so this specimen here is the internal cast of that shell that's been broken. Spirula spirula, we often see them washed up on the beaches up here in the north. We know of a large palm frond from the west coast in the South Island, but we get farm, palm fronds similar size and preservation in northern New Zealand, in Parangaringa, and also around the southern Hokianga here, or both of 18 million year old early Miocene, both in alluvial plain setting on the sides of that northern land area. Also around Hokianga there, in some of the water sediments, we get a number of leaf fossils and a number of pot fern fossils. There's a fossil blacknum, like the modern blacknum, splenium, and here's bracken, fossil bracken ferns, or in the early Miocene around South Hoganga. And now I'll move across to the Coromandel since we're dealing with terrestrial fossils and look at some of those from the volcanic sequences and the, the lake sediments within the, the volcanic sequences of the Coromandel. Here's the age of the Coromandel and Wittianga group uh, volcanics here from about 16 million through to about 3 million years there they were erupting. So uh, Here's an example of fossil large leaf brassi group Notophagus preserved in Sinta from Finuakiti over here on the Coromandel. Uh, Great Barrier down here at Medlands. As, uh, this is the fa famous locality here, just a hole dug in the stream bank. And it has beautifully preserved leaves, even with some insect damage to these leaves here. And they're of middle Miocene age and also fossil freshwater mussels, also coming from Medlin Stream. Uh, a relatively new find uh, that Liz Kennedy's been working up. This was her in 2019, excavating in a, a driveway of a person putting in a new house. And these are of late Miocene age, 8 million years. You can see the beautifully preserved leaves here that we're getting. There's a fern. And here's the only fossil extinct toa toa, Philocladus, with cones still attached. Beautiful specimen here. And the Coromandel 
there's a beautiful petrified wood, as we can see in all these different localities up through here, but there's also petrified wood of Miocene age and a number of other places through northern New Zealand. Fossils of late Miocene age, by this time, all of Northland has been uplifted and there's very little marine uh, sediments or marine incursion over the land areas that we have today now. And the only place we find late Miocene fossils are generally in Northland at Waikuku Beach and here in Doubtless Bay. So we'll have a look at uh, a fossil from Doubtless Bay that you will all have heard of, here it is here. And these are the miniature fossil coconuts from Keeper's Beach. Here's some in situ fossil forests and the lignites that were uncovered beneath the sand of Keeper's Beach a few years ago and are now deeply buried again. Uh, they're not actually true coconuts. Uh, Dick Ent and I uh, worked up that they were in fact the South, related to the South American mountain coconut, Paradubaya. Here's a, a modern Paradubaya palm growing in Auckland today. These are 10 million year old late Miocene age. Here's some of those nuts on that Paradubaya in Henderson. And here's the tree again. And these are the fossil specimens. Moving on to the late Pliocene age fossils, four to three million years age. That time in the Southern Northland Coromandel area, it was all land across this area. And there were rivers that drained the Coromandel, the Clevedon River coming through to the Manukau lowlands here, the Maramarua River coming through here. These are grey wacky highs that were already begin to be uplifted, but at that time the Hauraki Rift had not yet founded. And so the rivers were flowing from east to west. And in this vicinity through here, they were beginning to, they were flowing into the sea. So we have a number of estuaries situations here with deposits containing fossils. Some are freshwater, some are brackish, and some are fully marine. The Peachlands, uh, also at Weymouth and Kids Beach and Krakow. And these fossils have mostly been worked up just in the last few years by Otago University PhD student Ian Geary. Here's his thesis he's just handed in. And uh, he's found over 50 specimens of bracket fungus of Pliocene age. They're the only the second known occurrence in New Zealand of bracket fungi. The other was from the Waikato coal measures of the Eocene age. And these bracket fungi are now being found from Beachlands, Weymouth and Wattle Downs. You can see the size of the larger specimen that Ian's holding, beautiful specimen. Ian's done wonderful work with the fossil fruits and seeds as well. Uh, he's got the richest known occurrences of fruit and seeds in New Zealand from both Beachlands and Weymouth uh, of Pliocene age. More than 50 different kinds. Here's the she oak, casuarina seeds here. Here's some of the diversity that he's been pulling out. Hopefully we can get Ian to talk to us about his work sometime in the series, Daniel. He's also been pulling out New Zealand's only second known occurrence of fossil mussels, mosses in New Zealand. And I'm not sure I've got the exact total number here. I've got 32 different species of mosses, I believe he's got out. He's been working with Jessica Bieber. And here's some of his beautiful pre preparations, those mosses. But we'll leave that for Ian to tell us about some other time. He's got New Zealand's only fossil lichen found by Ian in leaf beds at Beachlands on the underside of a leaf. It's a Foley colus lichen. This is the modern Foley colus lichen, Strigula elegans, and this appears to be a Strigula, which is found on the underside of leaves at Beachlands from the Pliocene. In the same locality, we've got fossil seagrass, only the second known fossil seagrass occurrence in New Zealand. The other one's in North Canterbury, but hasn't been refound that locality in recent times. And we've now got it at Weymouth and Karaka Point. Here you can see some of the Zostra seagrass here. And here we can actually see a horn shell from that intertidal brackish environment, which the seagrass is growing on. Moving over to Mangary, some of you will be aware that recently uh, the wastewater water care people dug big shafts at Mangary for a new uh, works there and intercepted the Pliocene shell bed at 40 metres depth. They dug out a lot of the material and heaped it up in a huge heap. And many of us in Auckland have been spending our spare time fossicking through this and coming up with lots of fossils. I believe Nathan Collins is probably going to talk to us a bit about that corner later in the series. So I'm only going to mention one, uh, one fossil, the world's oldest fossil flax snails. In fact, uh, Fred Brook and I have just learned today that paper's been accepted 
describing two new species of fossil flax snail, three to 3.6 million years old. This one of the, the present New Zealand genus Maori stylus, and this one of a new genus Archaeostylus manicauensis. This is the living Placostylus, which lives to today at Three Kings uh, at North Cape and also out on the Poor Nights, three different species. And the oldest fossil flax snails in the world up till now had been maybe last interglacial, 120,000. These are three to 3.6 million years old, and they've been found in marine sediments in the Manukau Harbour. And we've now got 10 paratypes looking like this of this particular species. We're nearly finished. We're coming into the fossils of Quaternary Age, the last 2.6 million years. Here we have the map showing the distribution of those sediments. The brighter yellow is the, the dune and beach sands, and the lighter yellow is the alluvial sediment up here on the top of our column. Puna Beach, right in the heart of Auckland a few years ago, the sand moved and it exposed a fossil forest in the beach, about one million years old. Along the, across the harbour, Holland Island in the Waitema Harbour, Waitemata Harbour, we get this. These are all stone made of petrified burrow cast, shrimp burrow cast that look like stag's horns. Here we see some here. They're about one million year old and they look a bit like mangrove roots. And in fact, a geographer took us on a trip there to see the mangrove roots, but we had to tell him that in fact, they're their fossil burrows of shrimps. And you can see Hugh Grenfell published on those a while ago. Like the South, we have a few moa footprints up here in the North. This one is a little bit more obscure. It's in a road cutting at Murawai, and you can see these depressions down here, cutting across or pushing down into these sediments through here, another one down in here. These are them through here. They're very reminiscent of the dinosaur footprints we see around Northwest Nelson. Uh, Greg Brown, who's also what tonight identified and recognized. So we've recognized these. They're in the Pleistocene, about a million years old, within uh, sands, sandstones here, that have the sedimentary features as if they accumulated on the edge of a dune lake. And just recently, these one, approximately one million year old Moa footprints were found in sandstone block that fell from the cliffs here in the Kuiper Harbour. And that's come from a block over here. And they've been dated by me at between one, at one and a half and half a million years old at the South Head, found last month. I consider Moa gizzard stones are fossils as well. They're the traces of, of animals. And we have lots of Moa gizzard stones as everywhere around New Zealand does, particularly beautiful polished specimens. This collection from Miti Miti, up here, and this lot from Kawarua on the west coast in here. And I published a few years ago a little paper claiming that moas were New Zealand's first rock hounds. Most of the gizzard stones, what we find, are quartzos, often having agates and jaspers and various other semi-precious gemstones in the collection that have been polished in the gizzard before the animal died or coughed them up. And there we have the, the rock hounds collection. Getting younger still, swamp cowrie deposits. Many of you will have heard of the large swamp cowrie deposits that are being dug up these days and used for wood carving. And you can see here that there's been a considerable amount of dating done on them in recent years. And you can see the age ranges running from older than 50,000 through to the younger than 1,000 years in age, right throughout Northland here. This one here uh, is from the Manukau Harbour and we don't precisely know the age of this particular cowrie log in that fossil forest there. But at Eshul Matar, in the cliffs behind there, is the forest, forest, the remains of a forest that was flattened and fossilized by base surge eruptions from the Mangatakitaki volcano, Ellets Mountain, right near the Auckland airport. Here you can see a tree in situ that's been pushed over by the base surge flowing from the volcano out in this direction. The top has been blown off and, and Big branches are found in the, in the layers of tuff beneath. So all the leaves were stripped off by the wet ash and uh, preserved in the lower layers of, of tuff. And here we can see some of them here, Rimu, Tanikaha, and Kauri leaves. It's been dated at 85 to 90,000 years old. At Puna, we have the only fossil forest that's been preserved in a lava flow in New Zealand. It's 200,000 years old in the lava flows that came from Lake Pipuki volcano. You see Rangatoto. These are the, the molds of some of the tree stumps 
over 200 of them here from the, the reef at Takapuna Beach. And here's the bowl, the straight bowl of a cowrie that's collapsed into the molten lava and its shape has been captured as it was being run along and the lava cooled and solidified as basalt around it. We're down to the Holocene now, so we must be nearly finished. Time's doing very nicely. Sites with Holocene bird and reptile bones. In Northern New Zealand, there are no land vertebrate bones found uh, older than about 10,000 years. But bird, reptile and frog bones occur in Holocene dune deposits here in orange. You can see here in the north, coming down through here. They're also found in cave deposits, particularly at Otangaroa, Waipu Caves and Abbey Caves, and the lava cave down here, in swamp deposits down here at Clevedon, and Moa Hunter Midden sites, also in with the crosses up in the far north, but particularly on the east coast of the Coromandel and around the inner Gulf Islands around Auckland. We have frog bones in some of these caves, like at the Waipu Caves here. Four species of Lyopelma bones have been identified from those cave deposits, including two of the three extinct quaternary species of Lyopelma. I see there's now six extinct Lyopelma species from the Miocene to quaternary New Zealand. This is what a modern one looks like, of course. These are the two cave systems they both come from, Otangaroa and Waipu Caves. We have the bones of New Zealand's largest skink. It's only known extinct skink as well. It's believed to have been 25 centimeters long, <coughs> found in caves, uh, up both of these, Oligosoma, sorry, down here, where is it? Northlandic, oh, Northlandica, there it is there. And we have the bones of four moa species preserved in dunes. It was studied by Phil Milner for his PhD, particularly up here in the north at Tom Bowling, Tiwerahi and Tokarau Beach. It's by Fuku, is a collection of stout legged moa from Tokarau Beach. <laughs> Finally, bones of other extinct burns occur in the dunes. Things like the Laughing Owl, the Huia, the New Zealand Raven, the New North Island Takahi, the Adsbill, and the New Zealand Pelican. So I hope you will agree with me that we certainly have some fossil treasures up here in northern New Zealand. Thank you very much.